All right, now we can get started. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Luba Glukova, and I'm here to tell you uh, a very spooky Halloween story in the spirit of the upcoming holiday. Boo. <laughs> um, and the subject of this story is deep learning's most dangerous vulnerability, adversarial attacks. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of content here, um, so I'm going to ask you to please do ask questions, but save them for the end. I don't have a hard stop, so I'm happy to just keep going, take this offline. Yes. It is, yeah, yeah, and they're actually filming this too. <laughs> Hello world. <laughs> um, excellent question, good, yeah. Um, so please save the rest of your questions until after the presentation, and I'd be happy to take them offline and out of the room. Um, but this is going to be an unbalanced relationship in that I will get to ask you questions. So first question for the audience, um, just to get a feel for your familiarity with deep learning, how many of you are actively uh, developing deep learning models, whether that's in a classroom, Coursera type setting, or on the job. Um, yes, that worked. Okay, excellent. And how many of you are fairly new to deep learning? You've read the headlines, you know a little bit about the applications, but you haven't actively uh, trained a model. Okay, so wide spectrum. Excellent, good. Uh, so for those of you on uh, the newer end of the spectrum, uh, this might be a little bit scarier of a story than for those of you a little bit more experienced. Um, but we're all in together, so um, let's take off on the ride. All right, so another question for you, the audience. <laughs> uh, what do you see as the biggest risk introduced by runtime reliance on deep learning? It's a big question. There's a lot going on there. So runtime reliance of deployed deep learning. Uh, we're talking about any time that we're separating the human from the decision-making portion. Any time we have automation. Yes. Uh, what was that? It's a black box. It's a black box. So tell me more about that. Yes. Yes, and uh, what are some tangible consequences that could arise from that? Yes, bias, excellent, okay, that's good. Yeah, I felt like you were inching towards that. Excellent, okay, other, other potential risks? Yes, yes, okay, so we might be thinking of the same headline. Okay, excellent, good. Yes, yes, that is definitely one um, horrific potential consequence and one that we've seen in the headlines not too long ago with yeah. the Uber self-driving vehicle, yes. Any other, one more, yes? There's, there's Yes, yeah, that's definitely one to give us some spooky uh, nightmares. <laughs> and it's real, it's real, that's the scary part. So again, anytime that we're sort of separating the human uh, decision-making component or taking that out of the loop and having machines uh, do the decision-making for us. There's the potential of autonomous vehicle deaths that we've seen, um, the bias uh, influencing HR decisions, and then um, influencing our military decisions. One more, yes. <laughs> Yes, excellent, and that is actually a great segue to what I will be talking about. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we touched on some of these, um, the Uber self-driving car, killing the pedestrian, uh, the Amazon AI 
uh, HR tool that was actually in use from 2014 to 2017. Um, only after then, after it was discovered that there was bias baked into the model, uh, that they decided to take it offline after it was already used for three years. It's crazy. Uh, and then above that, um, IBM Watson giving incorrect uh, treatment recommendations to cancer patients with potentially deadly consequences, pretty bad. Uh, and then um, we've seen deep fakes, uh, some familiar uh, politician faces, faces up there. Uh, so there's sort of definitely um, potential dire consequences of um, generating content, specifically in the space of pornographic content, uh, depicting individuals that were never actually there. So some potential damaging reputation there. Uh, and there are many more. So we know there are tons of headlines. Um, uh, a little bit on a lighter note, so this came across my newsfeed recently um, on the AI memes, uh, AI and deep learning memes for backpropagated poets. It's a great Facebook group if you want a little bit of a nerdy laugh. Uh, Nikhil Agarwal posted, looking forward to being killed by autonomous car since my haters repeatedly uploaded my image into the database with the tag trash can. <laughs> Uh, so this algorithm is being trained on to see Nikhil and identify them as, as a trash can and ultimately run him over because that's what vehicles do with trash cans, right? <laughs> All right, so we, we know there are potential dire consequences of deployed deep learning, but we've also seen uh, some of um, the, the claims to fame of deep learning. And deep learning itself has proven itself um, as a powerful ally across a wide variety of industries. If you want um, to see some examples of that, you can come join me in uh, Las Vegas this summer at Deep Learning World. We're entering our third year, and we have a great array of speakers speaking to how they're actually deploying deep learning within their organizations. So a little bit of the, the positive side of the spectrum. However, uh, we know that this power does not come baked into the modeling method. Even though it can be a black box at times, this black box requires well-crafted expert design. And as machine learning developers, as AI engineers, um, deep learning engineers, we know um, uh, that this design, uh, that we must take pride in keeping clean machines, um, as this picture dictates. However, uh, research into adversarial examples or adversarial attacks, as I'll be referring to them in the remainder of this talk, has shown how seemingly robust networks with impressive predictive capabilities um, can be vulnerable to attacks and can make mistakes that look ridiculous to us humans. And these mistakes expose fundamental blind spots in the training of our algorithms. So in the remainder of our time together, I'll be discussing three different types of attacks. And these types speak to what is necessary from the attacker standpoint, what information is necessary in order to execute the attack. So how much does the attacker need to know about our model? And perhaps more importantly, or more interestingly, um, what can we do as developers to arm our models against these attacks, and what is it exactly about uh, deep neural networks that makes them vulnerable? All right, so a little bit of a background on, on deep learning for those of you newer to it. Um, it's nothing new, it's been around for a while, arguably since the 40s or 50s, depending on when you want to define the birth of neural networks. Um, and it went, the research into this field went through several AI winters. You might have heard of these phases when raw funding was pulled. Um, the, the investors didn't see the vision. However, few individuals out there, the few that continued research, they ended up being the pioneers of our field, and they ended up landing us where we are today. So we have a lot to thank them for. That, so those many decades of research, coupled with the fact that thanks to the internet, we've been able to amass these huge data sets upon which we can train our algorithms. And then, on top of that, uh, the massive compute resources that we have nowadays. So those three things, the research, the data, and the compute power, 
uh, propelled us into this deep learning revolution that we find ourselves in today. Many of the examples that I'll be discussing today um, have to do with image recognition, one specific application of deep learning. However, that's, that's not the only application that's out there. However, it is a pretty cool one. So with image recognition, um, we, we can feed a model into a trained network and through a series of transformations, through a series of layers, learn higher and higher level features or deeper and deeper representations of the image and ultimately train on top of those features. So it sort of does the feature extraction, feature engineering, and the training all in one swoop. Sounds pretty nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, deep learning, um, we've been able to uh, propel ourselves to, to new heights, to um, new levels of, of performance, thanks to the deep learning revolution that we find ourselves here now. Um, and however, uh, as we'll see, uh, these models can still make mistakes that look absurd to us individuals. So we see some of these examples as we move forward. Uh, so we still have yet to reach that AGI, that artificial general intelligence that everyone keeps talking about. And any Westworld fans in the room? One, two, okay, two years ago there were a lot more hands up. <laughs> I think we're on the downslope. Uh, so in, in the, to quote Westworld, uh, we're not quite here yet. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I don't, wanna, I don't want to undermine the fact that thanks to deep learning, uh, we've been able to do a lot. Um, we've been able to uh, reach these new levels of performance. However, these performance benchmarks that we've, been, um, that we've been able to surpass, they illustrate how well a model can execute a given task that's predefined by humans. So there's still a very vital human component in all of this. Again, we must take pride in keeping clean machines. Uh, so on the flip side of that, what happens when a human or a bad guy or gal uh, tries to mislead a model by architecting malicious content? We'll see that moving forward. Our adversarial attacks are such malicious content. They act like optical illusions for models. So like this Herman grid, which is designed to make you see gray blobs where there are none at the intersections of those white lines. Adversarial attacks are designed to cause models to make mistakes. Cool story, bro. <laughs> so optical illusions are interesting, but are they important? Well, in the case of adversarial attacks, yes. Uh, in the case of these security applications, they can pose some pretty serious consequences. So for example, at the airport, uh, an attacker can disguise uh, prohibited content, um, such as weapons, in luggage. Uh, when it comes to autonomous vehicles, an attacker can put a sticker or spray paint on a stop sign to make an autonomous vehicle misrecognize or misclassify that stop sign. And in the case of computer security, an attacker can disguise malicious content to be deemed as legitimate. Just a few examples. So again, I'll be discussing three different types of attacks, and the types speak to what it takes from an attacker's standpoint to execute the attack. So first, there's the white box attack. And you can think of this as the scenario where the attacker has infiltrated your engineering team. So she is on board, she has full access to your model repository, she sees all the parameters, all the training data, there are no secrets kept from her. Then there's the gray box. So in that case, you can think of it as an attacker having hacked into your servers. Luckily, you've encrypted your models sufficiently to prohibit him from actually seeing the code, but he can run your models and see the output scores, the confidence scores of those trial runs, sort of the gray box. And then finally, there's the black box. In this case, the attacker is completely external, um, has no access to your model repository, to any of the training data. She can simply execute an attack in the real world 
and see what would happen. But oftentimes you can imagine that's a very costly way to learn. So black box attack. All right, so each one of these examples that I'll bring up um, reference uh, a uh, research paper at the bottom. So if you'd like more information, you can Google that reference down there. Uh, and this specific paper that depicts the first example is a very important paper. So if you're gonna read one paper, uh, I recommend you start with this one. Uh, we'll come back to it again and again throughout uh, this slide deck. So this is Ian Goodfellow at Al's paper from 2015 in which uh, the team shows how layering seemingly imperceptible noise on top of an image can make a model misclassify the image. Um, so you see that in the left-hand corner we have a white box here. That means that in order to execute the attack, the attacker would need full access to the model. And that is because to determine this noise, this noise actually indicates how we must modify each and every pixel of the image in order to get the model to classify it as the target class of a given. And in order to generate the noise, we need access to the gradient of the model. So we have to know exactly in which way we modify each and every pixel. Now, if we were to layer this noise at full opacity on top of the image, we would just see the noise, right? It would not be as interesting of an attack. Because of this weight vector of 0 0.007 in this case, we have an image that results that looks to us, to the human eye, exactly like the same image on the left. It's the panda. However, to, um, to the model, uh, the image now depicts a gibbon. And what's startling is that now it's a gibbon with 99.3% confidence. As opposed to before, the model was mm, a little kind of certain that it was a panda. So it's now more confident that it's the wrong, incorrect class. And before reading this paper, I had no idea what a gibbon looked like, so I personally had to Google it, and there you go, you're welcome. Learning something new every day. Similarly furry creature, but a little bit more ferocious. Uh, <laughs> so the author showed that with an epsilon of 0.1, again, that's that weight vector, um, so that's significantly higher than that 0 0.007 we see there, but still that led to imperceptible changes. Uh, on a single architecture, single type of model, on the CIFAR-10 benchmark data set, they were able to achieve an 87% success rate. So that means nearly nine out of every 10 attacks were successful. That's pretty startling. So second example um, is Sue et al's paper depicting how modifying just a single pixel of an image can result in a successful attack. And this right here is a gray box attack, meaning they didn't need access to the gradient. Uh, they simply needed uh, access to the confidence scores of a resulting attack. And they were able to, instead of using the gradient, uh, use a genetic algorithm called differential evolution in order to determine exactly which pixel is optimal to change. Uh, the author showed that by changing just a single pixel across um, on, runs across three different models of, again, that CIFAR-10 data set, they were able to achieve a 63 to 73% success rate. So a little bit lower success rate. And also note that this is an untargeted success rate. So that means instead of classifying the panda specifically as a gibbon, uh, they were simply concerned with classifying the panda as anything but a panda. So looser constraints and lower uh, success rates. But again, uh, they needed a lot less to know in order to execute the attack. So pretty remarkable. Finally, there's the adversarial patch. And um, before we dive into the technical details, uh, does anyone want to guess or let me know what this looks like to them. Sort of looks like a futuristic. Yeah, OK, great. <laughs> kind of looks like a futuristic toaster, something from like Aliens or Star Wars or something. Hmm? It looks like a sub molecular cloud. Oh, yeah, right, 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 yes. Um, yeah, so something like out of a science fiction movie. Um, 
a painted rock. Yeah, it's very shiny. And it's got some like weird pink goo in the corner there. Um, so this is Brown et al's adversarial patch. And you can actually go and print this patch and try it out for yourself. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. So this patch right here, they have several in the paper. This one was generated with white box access to an ensemble of models. They also have one that was generated with white box access to a single model. This ensemble patch was generated, again, with white box access. However, the author showed that it's successful in attacking previously unseen models. Um, so models with uh, completely different architectures and trained on disjoint sets. No worries. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so a little demo here. All right. So in this video, um, you're going to see on the left-hand side uh, the actual input to uh, the classifier, and then on the right-hand side, a bar graph of the confidence scores for the top four classes. So we see when the input is a banana, banana yeah, <laughs> the classifier, good, sanity check, the classifier is a decent classifier, uh, it's fairly certain it's a banana, good, all right. Now, watch what happens when we introduce a patch. Now, this patch looks a little bit different from the patch we saw, um, the futuristic looking Star Wars biological organism. <laughs> this looks like an actual toaster, actually with uh, bagels coming out of it. Um, and now, the classifier is still fairly certain that there's a banana in there, um, but also assigning some probability to a toaster. So, the classifier is like, well, you haven't completely fooled me. That's not a real toaster. That's still a real banana. Um, however, watch what happens when we take that patch away and we introduce this super toaster. <laughs> um, the classification, the confidence score goes, well, I want to say through the roof, but it's not through the roof. It's to the roof. <laughs> Um, the classifier is now fairly certain that what is depicted here is a toaster. And now it's, you know, maybe ever so slightly, like 1% of banana. Uh, so that's pretty, pretty shocking difference between super toaster and regular toaster. All right. So to, to the model, um, this patch, this picture here is more of a toaster than a real toaster? That's a very good question. So what happens is uh, that this, uh, this adversarial patch exploits how models assign a single label for inputs that potentially have multiple potential labels attached to them. So what we saw when there was a banana and a fake toaster patch, it assigned predominantly that single banana label. Uh, by, by generating, so the way that it does is by generating an input um, that's highly salient to the model. So it's more of a toaster than a real toaster to the model itself. The author showed that at 20% uh, the size of the entire input, uh, this adversarial patch was 80 to 90% successful when it was generated with white box ensemble access two models that are different from the ones that it was attacking. So pretty striking. So again, in the previous two examples, we saw how layering seemingly imperceptible noise, modifying all of the pixels was successful. And then we saw how modifying just a single pixel could be successful. And now we see how sticking this patch on any input can be successful on any model, even when the model is different architecture, different disjoint training sets, than uh, the patch upon which mo this model was generated on. So technically, if you wanted to evade, <laughs> I was tempted to walk in here with something like that, but that would be too far, too nerdy. <laughs> um, technically, you could use this patch to evade facial recognition systems. Um, and actually, I encourage you to go out and print the paper. You can actually print it out and cut out the patch and give it a whirl. They do. Awesome. Great. Well, <laughs> and on that note, there's actually uh, the cvdazzle.com thing where you can actually read about the latest 
facial recognition evading makeup tricks. So on the left hand side, you see two CV dazzlers um, uh, depicting certain hairstyles and makeup tricks that make them imperceptible to human, uh, to facial recognition systems. Whereas their two friends um, on the left there um, ha can be recognized by facial recognition systems. So I can encourage you to go check out CV Dazzle, see um, the latest and greatest uh, makeup tricks. <laughs> so back to our adversarial toaster, um, the paper actually illustrates a very interesting point about adversarial attacks, and that is that they generalize. That an attack trained with access, whether it's white box, gray box, whatever, <laughs> access to a single model or to an ensemble of models can be successful on models of a completely different architectures trained on disjoint training sets. It's pretty fascinating. All right, so as machine learning developers, as deep learning engineers, what can we do to arm our models against these attacks? Well, in order to better arm our models, uh, let's see if we can better understand or diagnose what it is about deep learning models that actually makes them vulnerable to these attacks. That goes beyond my training as a furniture salesman. <laughs> the Simpsons, so good. <laughs> um, so let me turn the tables and ask you, what do you think it is about deep neural networks that makes them vulnerable to adversarial attacks? Any, any ideas? Uh, yes, something right there. Highly suggestible, okay. Interesting, maybe, yes? I think there's, yeah, right there. Gaps in the Mmm, right, right, so like we saw the single pixel or the noise. Okay, interesting, yes? Right, right. But so what is it in the actual training data um, that's generating the vulnerability to these single pixel changes? Because that isn't, that isn't in the actual training data. And that might be the underlying issue. Yes? The, the correlations between the label and the image are not really good at all. Because what's going on is we're saying, oh, it's 70% or 60%. That's based upon another correlation. So if our input is not not as confident as, as we are. Ah, okay. Okay, interesting, yes. Uh Yes, and I will actually use that point um, to transition to my next slide. So hold your, hold your thoughts. Um, that is actually uh, one of the original theories, um, overfitting. <laughs> Thank you, SpongeBob. Uh, overfitting was one of the, the, the original theories um, that uh, these researchers had in terms of why this was happening. So we have these highly complex models with lots of parameters trained on many data sets. Maybe they're, they're overfitting to, to those examples and they're not able to generalize well to other things like these single pixel or multi-pixel attacks. So a little bit of an overview um, on overfitting. Um, so if we have um, the simple two-class 
classification problem of differentiating um, between red dots and blue dots. What's one decision boundary um, that we could draw between these two? Straight line. Straight line. Yes, awesome, great. So um, we could um, train a logistic regression or a support vector machine. Uh, these two classes are linearly separable. So a very simple classifier would be a straight line. Not so simple classifier <laughs> uh, would be something like this that um, this has many parameters and these crazy decision boundaries around uh, these red dots and blue dots. So it correctly classifies these two. Um, and given new points, so these give, given these two new points, it would obviously classify them as red. They're in the red boundary. So they'll get classified as red. Um, but then if we retrain the same, um, the same classifier, because it's complex, it'll have a new decision boundary that will be equally crazy but completely different. And the new points will get classified in different ways. So now it'll be in the blue region, and that will be in the red region. But we already saw um, in the example of the adversarial patch that different models classify the same points, in those cases the attacks, in similar ways. So it can't be the case that they're, um, that they're overfitting. Because if, it was, if, it, if they were overfitting, if we were to retrain the same model, they would classify these new points, um, the same points, in... Um, different ways. So it's not overfitting. Sorry, SpongeBob. <laughs> um, so I'll cut straight to the chase. Spoiler alert. Um, the problem lies in the fact that these deep neural networks are high dimensional, linear ish extrapolating machines. And I'll break this down in a lot of detail, hopefully sufficient detail as we move forward. Uh, but what, what this, these properties of deep neural networks illustrate is the trade-off that we've made. Um, we've traded in model robustness to adversarial attacks for the sake of fast training. We want to be, be bigger. We want to be questionably better. We want to be faster. Um, and we've traded in the ability to be um, more robust to these attacks. OK, so breaking it down step by step. Um, this, uh, this slide, um, the content on it is based on a blog post by Andre Karpathy in which he really breaks down exactly what it is about, specifically about um, convolutional neural networks that makes them vulnerable to attacks. And he has this beautiful example of a very simple 10-feature logistic regression and its vulnerability to an attack. It's absolutely, it's, it, it's absolutely beautiful. So 10 features, it's a little bit more than the two-feature example we were working with before with the red dots and blue dots. Very simple to classify as just a straight line between the two. If we have three features, now maybe it's a hyperplane instead of a line. With 10 features, it's a little bit more complex to visualize, so please don't ask me to um, talk about how the two classes would be separable in there. That goes beyond my abilities in this universe. <laughs> um, but again, he is able to demonstrate that 10 features logistic regression susceptible to um, adversarial attacks because of its linear nature. Now, the fact um, that we're working with convolutional neural networks means we're working with high dimensional data, high dimensional features. For example, if we work with a single one megapixel image, so 1,000 by 1,000 pixels across three channels, we have three million features per input. So three million times the number of inputs is how many features we're working with. These, this high dimensional nature just exacerbates the problem that's demonstrated with the 10 feature simple linear classifier. But wait a second, you should be going. <laughs> Deep neural networks are linear? No, that's bananas. And yes, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, they're, not, they're not really linear. They're linear-ish. So the one thing that, the, the thing that makes uh, deep neural networks nonlinear are these activation functions. 
but the thing is that the activation function du jour, the one that's popular in, um, in research and in industry right now, is ReLU. And it's highly linear. So this ReLU activation function is zero up until a certain point, and then it's just y equals x. Now, even other functions that are being used widely in industry and in academia, sigmoid and tanh, they look less linear. However, the practice is to saturate our training, um, our training uh, process in the portion of those activation functions that is highly linear. And we're doing this for the sake of fast training. So we're trading in our, very good question. Um, very fast? <laughs> it depends on the model complexity and it depends on uh, the dimensionality of the input. So, yes, exactly. It's Googleable, yes. Um, but we're, we're applying this to a wide variety of applications, so it just depends on what you're benchmarking. It's like how fit is fit. I don't know. <laughs> 10 push-ups, maybe? Yeah. Um, so, in, um, so the takeaway from this is that these functions um, are nonlinear, yes, but our use of them is leaning towards linear for the sake of being fast in our training. And because of that lean towards linear or that tendency to opt for linear-ish, uh, that creates susceptibility to adversarial attacks. So again, fast training. Um, wins over model robustness. Okay, but what's, so maybe I've convinced you that deep neural networks are linear-ish and they're definitely high dimensional. Hopefully you're on board with that. So what's, what's the big problem? Well, it's the whole uh, extrapolating issue. So let's go back to our two class example um, with the simple linear classifier. So if we train a simple linear classifier, um, everything to the upper right of that line will get classified as red, and to the lower left will get classified as blue. So what if we take one of these points and nudge it across the decision boundary into the blue region, but far away from the blue points? Our linear classifier will extrapolate that decision and say, well, that point is blue despite the fact that there are no blue points in that region. And that's, that's essentially what's happening with these deep neural networks. We're generating this adversarial example. It gets classified as a class, even though there's no data supporting that class in that region. So linear models are overconfident when extrapolating. What's the alternative? The alternative is, instead of using these linear-ish activation functions, we use a highly nonlinear activation function, such as a radial basis function. So radial basis function neural networks exist, and they've been proven to be robust to adversarial attacks. The problem is they're computationally intensive. We just don't have the necessary compute power to do everything that we're doing with deep neural networks now using these highly complex activation functions. So it looks something like this, um, the sort of the limit of what my Google slide sketching will do. But the idea is where there are blue dots, it will be confident that uh, that the, the new data coming in is blue. And where there are red dots, it will be confident that it's red. And when there, when there are no dots, uh, it will not assign um, a confident um, uh, prediction to that. So it makes more sense than that uh, extrapolation example with the two linear classes. So that is our first countermeasure. Instead of using these linearish activation functions, we instead use uh, something more complex, uh, a nonlinear activation function, such as a radial basis function. What are some others? Well, let's go back to machine learning 101. <laughs> so the idea in machine learning is we, uh, we train a model um, on certain data. And with the hope that this model is able to generalize and assign accurate labels to previously unseen data. I've zoomed in on this for you. <laughs> so how does it go from being trained on, on, trained on certain data to then um, being confident on, complete, on previously unseen data? 
Uh, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Then a miracle occurs. Well, there are no miracles. Uh, what we hope as uh, machine learning developers is that the training data is somewhat representative of the kind of data that the model will see out in the wild, out in the real world. So how can we apply this to um, our model training for adversarial robustness? Well, we can inject adversarial attacks into our training process, like a vaccine. So one method is uh, called introspective convolutional networks. So I'll walk through this step by step. Um, in the first iteration of training our algorithm of red circles versus, versus blue um, crosses, we have um, a not so simple but um, classifier, the decision boundary of which is depicted here. Now, in the second step, we focus on one class, specifically the red class, and using the correctly classified points, we uh, generate adversarial attacks based on several of those points. And then we retrain the classifier uh, with those adversarial attack points being the not red sa um, samples in the training data. So now we have the red dots and we have the blue ones and then um, also the adversarial attacks being classified as not red. So that tightens the decision boundary around what is actually red. And then we repeat the process. Again, we use the correctly classified points from our previous iteration, generate adversarial attacks, use those as not red in the training of our next iteration, and that again tightens the decision boundary. The process repeats again until the decision boundary gets very tight and accuracy starts to go down, at which point we go all the way back to the beginning and we start the process over for the blue ones. So it's a very long process. However, uh, it's shown to be effective in reducing adversarial attack success rate from 51% to 31%. This is a process that works. However, what is the problem with this process here, similar to our previous? It's not fast, yeah. It's the same exact problem that we encountered before. It's computationally intensive. So imagine we're doing pretty bleeding edge work in training these algorithms on these huge data sets with these really complex architectures. We're already pushing the boundary. Can we push the boundary four times over for each and every class? It's crazy, it's insane. So the same problem that lies with nonlinear activation functions lies with adversarial trading, in that we just don't have the compute resources to create models that are robust using these two methods. I believe it's probably a combination of all of those. So we need, we need all the power that we can get. Um, so the first one touches on how can we improve our actual architecture in order to increase robustness. The second example, or the second countermeasure up on there, um, speaks to how can we improve our training data, how can we expand on that um, in order to improve robustness. And there are several other <laughs> Um, countermeasures that we can take. The second example, adversarial training, is somewhat similar to generative adversarial networks where we have a generator and we have a discriminator and they're duking it out for the greater good of our model's robustness. There's also a couple methods um, that would be able to identify, given an input, whether it's been tampered with or not, whether it's an adversarial attack or not. So feature squeezing, JPEG compression. And then there are ways that we can sort of obfuscate our gradient from the attacker, such as with defensive distillation or with gradient masking. And there are many more out there. I encourage you um, to take a look at the latest research to dive into checking some of these out. and. Perhaps more importantly, to get the conversation going, whether or not you're an active deep learning developer um, uh, or just a consumer of deep learning in the news, um, I encourage you to speak with your colleagues, um, educate yourself and others about the potential da dangers of adversarial attacks because the consequences are really real, especially as we increase our reliance on these tools and technologies. And that wraps up. Um, my presentation, and I believe we're uh, 15 minutes early, so we have time for questions. Yes. Yes. 